Hey everybody, Ron Elmer from Mountain Deer here. Now we're going to finish the other uh, part of our series there on caping the deer. We showed you how to get it off the, the main part of the body and now we're going to show you how to get it off the head. If you're hunting in a CWD state or you've got to transport back home, you're going to have to uh, take it off the head and leave the nervous system in the state that it came from. And um, you can pay somebody else to do it or you can just step out of your comfort zone just a little bit and give this a try. It's not hard and if you take the time to watch this, you'll see there's really not much to it and uh, it's pretty easy and it's not really that big a deal and with a little bit of practice at least you'll be able to tell your guide or whoever you know you're doing a good job or you're not doing a good job a couple of different options to consider when it comes time to do it one of them is how you start and where you make your cuts to start with there's a wingless fly a ked if you can see them good get them in the light here a little bit they're not ticks but they look like them they're a little wingless fly and they they crawl around and they live off the deer in the winter time live inside the hair he's looking for a place to slide in they're a little different than ticks and as soon as they warm up they start coming off remember that all wildlife has parasites of some kind so it's not a bad idea to wear gloves not a bad idea to uh, keep it away from your dog and your pets and stuff and, and go from there okay here's some of the different cuts you can do Here's your, your two antler burrs, your, your beams, where they come out. You can do a seven cut and cut from antler burr to antler burr and then down the back of the neck. Or we can do a T cut straight across, a little nick in the scalp towards the nose, and then down the back just enough to get through the neck. Or you can do a Y cut and come together. One of the things about a Y cut is that you not make it too big. If you make the Y too big and it comes way back here and it starts getting on the edge of the ears, that's kind of a little bit of a pain especially and when it dries it pulls on some. I like a small Y cut. Keep the Y real small and right near the top of the head and then go down the neck just far enough so that you're, you, you've got enough to get the skull up out of there. So that when you're done, the only seam you'll have is right in the very top of the head and the rest of your mount won't have any seam in it. So keeping the neck in the tube just like we've got here, and then going is really the way to go. This is a nice little New Hampshire deer. He's a nice one. Um, we're going to take the top off here. Um, when the deer's hanging, um, and especially like if the tongue has been out, all of the saliva that's inside the deer's mouth, there's bacteria there, and that will start rotting along the edge of it, especially if the tongue is hanging out of the mouth. So make sure that it's dry and it's clean, and wipe all the blood off from it and clean it right up, and try and keep blood from being on the white hair especially, or any hair where it's been dragged, because it'll soak into those tubes. If the tip is broken off, they're like straws, they're empty, and they'll soak up the blood and you can't get it out. So keep that in mind. Keep things as dry as possible and any of the three places around the mouth, the eyes and the ears of course is where bacteria would naturally be on its own. Keeping it dry will help keeping it from rotting. Most of the time I do a modified T. I just dig my tip in right by the antler burr and I cut straight across and I head for the other side. Let's see if I can do this and keep it from wobbling too bad on you and get back into my spot here. And it goes straight across and right up underneath the antler burr. And do that to each side. Now once I've cut straight across, and I've got it pretty decent there. One little tiny bit left in the middle. Then, right where everything wants to come together, I'll just make a little nick in the center. Just a little small cut in it. So that will help me line that up. And I'll come down the back of the neck. Now when it comes time for me to put it back together, I'll take all four of those corners, and now the hide is dead center and it sits right where it's supposed to, and it goes right back together really good. And it's not that you can't do a Y or a seven cut. They, they work just as well. And um, you can ask your taxidermist what he prefers. And um, 
A Y cut has always kind of been the standard practice, and if you do make a Y, just keep it kind of small. Now that I've opened it up, I'll just cut down the back of the neck just enough to clear whatever amount of backbone I have left. If you leave a lot of neck meat in it and it's real long, you'll need a longer cut down the back in order to get it out. Myself, I like to take it right up as close to the head as possible and then keep this cut real small so that the mount doesn't have any seams in it. Also too, it's really nice to take the cape and then when it's inside out, I'll put an A-frame inside of it and I'll stretch the neck and stretch it evenly and when it's in a tube, it stretches really even and nice and that helps you get it nice and stretched big so that when it shrinks, it goes back to the size that it was not the size that it is and shrink even smaller. And that's something you don't want to do. So I like to stretch it as much as I can and then make it go back to the size that it was. Now I'll just go underneath the antler burr just with a tip and I'll pull at it just a little small amount like that. Then I'll grab a pair of new nose and I'll grab onto it and I'll just give it a push and it'll rip right loose. You can just kind of push on it like that and it'll rip right loose with no cuts. I won't make any cuts in that part. And that'll help a little bit. And then do the same thing to the other side. Grab onto it and push it like that. Now this is nice and fresh so it cuts really easy. If they sit around, if they ride uh, in a vehicle for a lot of hours on the way home or whatever and they get real dry, it's gonna be a little tougher to get it off the antlers. Now I'll push it back on each side and open it up like so and then I'll stay right against the skull and I'll cut the whole base of the ear right loose. You can grab right onto it and kind of feel it and there'll be a big chunk of fat right there too and you can just trim right down through that and you'll come to the ear canal and you'll cut that off. Then you can push on this a little bit more and it'll rip a little farther. Western deer tend to have really big antler burrs that stick way out. Older deer will have real long big antler burrs and it's tough to get up underneath there and get it loose. Just take your time here. This is the best place to take your time and go nice and easy and get it, get it loosened up without doing a lot of cutting and ripping and tearing because it's easy to get frustrated and want to hurry it along. A nice sharp tip is really good. And again, stay right up to the top and just keep digging underneath some. Now we'll go into the center and just loosen that up off the scalp a little bit. And then, basically, it's the same thing again. Just get it started. You can pull on it some and just peel it right loose. There's about a hundred different ways of doing this and you don't necessarily have to go this route, but this is what I've been doing. And Teresa and I have probably done, I don't know, we must be working on 10,000 of these now. Between the two of us. Now we've gotten that whole thing right out and loose. When it comes time to put it back together, the hair patterns will line up. The hair coming in this direction and the hair coming in that direction, where these two come up like that, that is the very bottom outside right there. So when it comes time to mount it, it's important that that be lined up just like that. Okay, and we've opened up this side. We started around and pushed it some, and now we're just gonna go up and hold right on to the, the hide with your hand, and then just trim easy and stay right against the bone and kind of push towards the deer's head and not down into the hide. Because if you have a bend, you could cut right into the hide. My, my hide is underneath right here. If there's some meat and some fat on, it's okay. Don't worry about leaving meat on the, on the cape, it's all right. We can get that off later, easy enough. It wants to roll right back in on itself. Now you can see the ear canal and we've kind of taken everything loose and we're just working our way down through. You'll have to do some high and then some low and then bring this side down and catch up and you'll, you'll play catch up back and forth from side to side. grab onto it and I'll pull out some. Just kind of roll my fingers in underneath and then I can feel where the hide is. If you're cutting through meat, as you get down to hide, it will turn blue. See the blue starting in right there? As soon as you start getting things blue, you know that's as deep as you can go. 
and we'll catch this side up. Cut towards the deer's head, pulling away as you go. Just like so. Just keep rolling it forward and we're gonna to come to the eye sockets. Okay, now that we're down to the, the orbit and we're just starting on the eye, I like to reach inside and grab right a hold of the eyelid and have the whole thing right in my fingers. I'll put my finger right inside and grab his eyelid. Then there's no way that I'm gonna cut it because it's in my hand. And the eyelid is actually hooked right to the eyeball itself. So you'll have to gently just cut right along the edge of the cornea right there and that will come right loose. And I'll just pull and I'll have the eyelashes and the eyelid all right in there with it and it'll come right off just as nice. And then pull on it gently. And we'll come to the tear duct. This is his nictitating membrane right here. Some taxidermists like to have that in there. And you can leave that in there if you want to. Not the end of the world if you don't. It's up to you. You can be as fussy as you want. This is the time to just take your time and do it the way you like. Now, as you get forward and you start getting into the, uh, the gland, the tear duct right in the front right there, just take your tip and kind of dig straight in like so and pull nice and hard and it, it, the skin is actually right against the bone just above it on the nose but you pull on it and it'll come loose sometimes the actual gland itself will have chunks of bark in it it's not unusual for it to have a, a whole bunch of even I've had a couple of sticks buried right inside of there um, or a whole bunch of like sawdust mule deer they really stick a lot of sticks inside that gland it'll have a bunch of sawdust and stuff you want to dig that out of there and get that cleaned up. And then I'll do the same thing to the other side. You're just basically switching back and forth. See, I like to have my finger in it, and I want to grab right a hold of that eyelid. I don't want to cut that. It's another one of our friends. I'll grab right onto it and hold it right in my finger. And then just pull and cut kind of straight and square and it will open right up and you can see the eyelids and people will say oh I'm too scared I'll screw it up I can't do it and all kinds of excuses and like really you, you can do anything if you just take your time and you're patient about it and really there's almost no way if your taxidermist has any amount of experience there's no way that you can screw it up that can't be fixed just about I mean, I'm not saying be blatant with it, but there. Are, if, if you want a beautiful furniture, you need a nice log. It's the same thing. You want a nice cut. And when you learn how to cape and you, and you really get it, you learn how to put tree stands up and how to hunt, and you might just well learn how to cape too. It's one more skill. Um, it's an outdoor skill that's really good to have. And if it's something that you know how to do, there's, it's a part of your experience, part of the whole experience. And I want to know how to do it all myself. I love that. I love not being de dependent. Now as you get past the eyeball and past the tear duct, you'll come to the mouth. There'll be some skin and a lot of muscle on the edge of it. And what I'll do is way before I get forward very far, I'll cut right down through to the teeth and open up and that skin will come right away. And then I'll continue cutting right along the edge of the gums. And I'll just open that up and I'll work my way on the top a little bit and on the bottom a little bit. And all the skin that's on the inside of the mouth will come right off right at the edge of the teeth in the palate. So you can see what I haven't done yet. And you'll just cut right through to the teeth. Go right into the, as soon as you, right below the eye socket, just come right into the teeth. Just cut right down through till you get inside the mouth. Then grab it with your finger and pull and stay on the edge of the teeth and it comes forward just like that. It's really quick, easy, nothing to it. Let's catch the bottom up here. Peel that back, just like so. Then we'll come back on the side. We'll just peel that right open. And the same thing here. Uh, single edge ra razor blade, that's what Teresa likes to use. That works pretty good. It kind of beats on your knife. If you have a nice knife and you're going to need to do a lot of 
stuff and you can't sharpen it, you probably don't want to use a knife that you really need the edge on because you're cutting against bone quite a bit. We spend a lot of time sharpening knives around here because we cut right against the bone a fair amount. But if it's nice and sharp, you don't have to push as hard. And truthfully, a skinning knife, if it's super sharp, it's easier to cut holes. So I don't like it real, real sharp. And then I just continue right along the edge of the palette. And we'll get to the soft part of the cartilage on the nose, but we just keep going forward. And once you get to a point, it'll start wanting to open up a little bit more. And you can almost do it completely from the side at that point. As soon as I can get this to come through and around, I'm almost there. Catch the bottom up just a little bit. There we go. Now we'll stay right against the incisors on the front. And this is kind of the tightest spot in the lip, is, is right in that front corner. And we can go just like so. And just keep peeling away. My tip is pretty well destroyed on this knife now. <laughs> and it comes right loose. Again, keeping with that, we'll cut right through the cartilage, kind of on an angle, right from the top of the palate, right through to the nose. We'll do just like that. Just a little bit at a time, just cut real gentle. Just a small, small amount at a time. Don't get too crazy with the knife and start trying to get big stuff right away because it'll be easy to go through and cut in, pull the hide in underneath. And then just work your way right around and it comes right off. Okay, what we've done now is we've gotten the whole thing loose. We have all of our lip skin all the way around. And now you need about 3 8 of an inch you know from the hair up so you need right along the edge of it but we've gotten all that and the, even the nose is inside of it the other thing you can do is wipe as much of the saliva out of it as possible and keep it as dry as you can without over drying it we've gotten all the blood off from it we've taken a measurement from the end, corner of the eye to the end of the nose and then right in behind the ears, the smallest part of the neck, we take that measurement too. Those are the two measurements that you really need. You can even do one more time down around the atlas muscle where it's real kind of fat, three or four inches below the small part. You can even take a measurement there if his neck is really swollen. And that, that's an extra measurement that's really good to have. Myself, I like my capes nice and fresh. They are always better when they're fresh. It takes a couple days to freeze in a freezer good and solid. If you've left it out um, and didn't, you know, you reported it and it was left out and it didn't get to the freezer in a big hurry, sat around for a while, then you put it in the freezer and it takes a while to freeze and there goes three or four or five days and now I take it out of the freezer and it has to thaw for another day and then I work on it for part of another day before it gets salted and, and re really get all the bacteria stuff under control. So the, the quicker it gets to the freezer, the better your mouth, always. Um, and a cleaner, of course. I'll put it inside of a bag. I usually try and wrap the face inside and then put the other hair on the outside of it. Some insulates just a little bit better. Um, if it's a kind of nasty cape and I'm really worried about the face especially, I'll leave that on the outside so it'll freeze faster. And then when I thaw it, I can get right to it and take care of it as quick as possible and get it clean and get it worked on. Uh, once it's inside the bag, I try and get as much air out of there as possible. Uh, the longest I've had a cape in the freezer is like six years and I was still able to use it. But that's an extreme. Most of the time, a year or two is pretty good if you wrap them nice and tight and get them fairly air free. Um, take your nose to eye measurement and your smallest part of the neck measurement, write that down, have it on it, um, label it, put the date, usually that's another good idea to have on there. Um, once you've got it, uh, all ready to go and it's in the freezer and it's going to be time to get sawn on the head. Um, I'll make my cuts and get that part done and uh, clean it up. I usually let the skull air dry for a few days. Um, once we've sawed it out of there, I'll clean as much of the meat and the fat off it. Do it while it's fresh. Don't wait for it to be a dried out old piece of junk and then try and clean it. It, it gets nasty, the, the smell soaks into the bone and it's much easier to clean when the meat is all fleshy. Um, if you wanted to boil it, boil the water first, then turn it off 
and set it down inside that boiling water and just let it sit in it for like 10 minutes. I try and leave the antlers out and just have the, the bone down inside of it. You try the pan first and make sure your level of the water is right and everything. Um, to just keep it boiling on a stove is not a great idea because the heat comes around the sides of the whatever you're boiling it in the pot and it ends up heating the antlers up and it can make them crack. I've seen a few people light them on fire because the, boil, the water boiled all away and they just forgot about it on the stove. So I don't do any of those things. Um, and to try not to overheat the skull. If you've got a Boone and Crockett or a really big one, leave lots of extra meat in the skull. You know, the, the size of the, the, the cuts you make, leave lots of bone, right? When I mean meat, it's not meat, but it's actual bone. Leave a lot of bone to help hold it and make it sturdy. Um, most of the time, of course, the skull shrinks and the bigger the bone, the more it can shrink and want to pull in some. So i uh, just let it naturally air dry, get your 60 days over with, and then get it scored right off the bat as soon as your 60 days are up. And then we'll start cutting. What I like to do is line up this way and then be perpendicular to the nose. So I'll, I'll get halfway between the eye socket and the antler burr, right about here, and I'll cut straight down through, perpendicular to the nose. I'll cut right straight down through until I get right in here somewhere, about halfway or so. Then I'll tip it up and I'll take a knife and I'll trim some of the meat and the tendon away from the very back tip of the skull. And I'll set my sawzall right about here and I'll cut right straight down towards the eye socket, right down towards my cut, just like so. Then when it comes time to go inside of the mannequin, it'll be all set and ready to go. Once I've made those two cuts, now I'll take the brain and I'll just scoop that out and then pull that little small uh, layer on the inside of it out and you're done. When it comes to taking out the inside, I start right in the back. And I just bring that forward some like so. Then grab a pair of pliers, lift and twist at the same time. And you won't cover yourself too much with it. When it comes flying and popping out of there, you won't make too big a mess. And you can just kind of pry against the bone and finish lifting all that right out of there. That's right out of the way. Then I'll just take a knife and I'll go right along the side. Just trim the meat and the fat right off it. This is so much easier than letting it dry out into this big old hard thing you gotta chisel off. And it won't stink. Once you've removed all of this, if you wanna go to the boiling next, the boiling water, this little bit of meat that's left will brown right up and you can take a knife and just gently just rub it right off and it'll clean up really nice and easy. Also try and get some of the meat off the back part here. The tendon is kind of rugged right there, that ligament. few pieces up and we're in pretty good shape. Even this, if you don't, you got an older knife you don't care about, you can dig at it some. You can actually clean it up really good raw and it'll come out really nice without even having to boil it. In a few minutes it might take you to boil the water. You probably could have taken a knife and dug most of the, everything right off and cleaned it up pretty well. There's a small layer right against the bone. And you can actually peel some of that up too and it will clean up. Like I said, this is rough on your knife though. As usual, there's a hundred ways to skin a cat. And if all of you have suggestions, feel free to put it in our comments. And there's all, all kinds of ways of doing everything in life. What you have patience and time for. When I was a kid, I couldn't wait to do this kind of stuff because these were my antlers and I had to have them in my hand. So while I had them in my hand, I'm going to pick at them and clean them up. Not that hard. It makes it fun.
And that's pretty much all there is to it. If it's a whisker crooked or it isn't sawed quite perfect, and I can grind and sand on that when the time comes. And you could too, and make it fit on the wall in any way you want it. Um, but we talk about that some in our uh, plaque video where we make a horn plaque and you can see how to adjust and work on the, the bone there a little bit. But that's where it's at. And with a extra hour you can come home from whatever state you're in and you're legal and you're all good to go you have your cape and your horns everything's been separated and you can leave all that nervous system in the state where it belongs one last note about your leftovers from your deer and your animals the bones and stuff like that um, we put all of ours in the landfill and we send it with our garbage out we have a dumpster and it all goes in that and we send it away um, we're not going to take in animals from all over the united states and then leave those bones and all those potential problems of like cwd out on the land it's very important that we as hunters kind of clean up after ourselves especially when it comes to disease stuff i know that mother nature will want to put all that to work and it'll turn into um, grass and crows and coyotes and everything else that eats you know all the other animals that are out there but um, it's important to like not spread something like CWD which could really be bad for our local deer so like clean up after yourself and make sure that all that stuff is going in the right place and consider where it should be like Ontario wants you to put it right out um, right out in the field where it came from pretty much that's where they like you to return everything it's not a bad idea to have it there but some landowner might not like that so just Put some time and consideration into where you throw all your leftovers from your animals, especially if you're moving them a long ways. Thanks for watching everybody and uh, have fun out there. If there's any other suggestions or things that you think we ought to put on film, don't be afraid to let us know. Um, make sure that you uh, comment and subscribe and um, we hope our channel's helping you out some and some of the things you do and uh, with any help, Taylor will let my hand audition for the Blue Man Group. <laughs> <laughs> See you everybody, take care, bye bye.